Ok. Uh, thanks a lot uh, for uh, the organizer. It's my first uh, talk ever in person, so I'm uh, even more glad uh, for the invitation. Today we present our work, Proximal Point Imitation Learning, that is a joint work with um, Angeliki in uh, ETH, Gergo at UPF Barcelona, and uh, uh, Igor in uh, my lab, and Volkan, my advisor. So we will focus on uh, the setting of, does it work? Okay, thank you. We will focus on the setting uh, called the learning from demonstration, where uh, a learner asks uh, a sequence of state action pairs given by an expert and tries to learn uh, a behavior from them. Thinking about a real world example, you can think about uh, driving, where uh, humans are uh, able to provide uh, a sequence of uh, how to behave uh, in any traffic situation. The advantage of this setting are uh, evident when compared to reinforcement learning, because in reinforcement learning, uh, we need uh, a scalar value called uh, reward that is expressing uh, how good a certain action is. But uh, in a real-world situation like uh, Driving, it's difficult to come up to a scalar value that induces the optimal driving behavior. Within this family of um, algorithms, the research community differentiates between uh, inverse reinforcement learning and uh, imitation learning, where uh, we can notice the difference between the input and the output of the algorithms. If in standard reinforcement learning in uh, the central column of the table, we have uh, an input as input the reward function and we output an optimal policy, in imitation learning, we use the expert demonstration to learn uh, an optimal policy, while in inverse reinforcement learning, uh, we use the demonstration to infer the reward function that the expert was optimizing. And this can be used also to generalize uh, to new dynamics or to recover the optimal policy in the same environment. We will focus mainly in uh, the imitation learning setting, so the last column of the table, where uh, the um, exact setting uh, is that we are given a finite amount of sample, uh, denoted uh, as uh, any state and action pair. We don't assess at all the reward function signal, and we take all the more difficult situation where we don't know the transition dynamics of the environment. So we can use only samples from uh, a simulator of the transition dynamics. The notation uh, of uh, this talk is uh, recap in uh, this slide. We will uh, use the Markov decision process formalism, that is a tuple of six elements, a state action space, an action uh, set, P that denotes the transition dynamics, that is uh, a transition dynamic over state condition on state and action. A reward function R, that uh, however, remember, it's unknown in imitation learning. An initial distribution mu over the state set. And uh, gamma, that is a discount factor that is a scale between 0 and 1. When we talk about stationary stochastic policy, we mean a mapping from state to distribution probability of our actions. The state value function will be the expectation over the randomness induced by a policy pi in the MDP of the discounted sum of the rewards. And the performance objective, uh, when we call it, uh, when we talk about solving an MDP, we are trying to maximize over the policy space the expectation over the initial distribution of the state value function V. So this problem is difficult for uh, a series of reasons. In particular, we don't uh, have access to the dynamics, so we can only sample and we cannot compute uh, exactly a value function of a given policy. The state and action are potentially very large or continuous, so in uh, any bound uh, on the performance guarantee of an algorithm, we would like to avoid uh, the number of state and the number of action. And the objective formulated in this way is a non-concave in pi. So people uh, would um, came up with very simple examples showing that this is non-concave. 
However, there is an alternative way to solve uh, the problem via linear programming that uh, was introduced back in uh, the 1960, but um, recently is uh, uh, giving a second uh, popularity wave. And in this talk, we will uh, see how we can uh, provide an uh, efficient algorithm for imitation learning using the proximal point algorithm and the LP formulation. I would first like to uh, give a brief overview of uh, how to get the LP in uh, the reinforcement learning case and then go to imitation learning. So the classical way to solve an MDP is to find uh, a fixed point of the constraint of the first program that is uh, unique because the right hand side is a gamma contraction in infinity norm. So in this program, we have only one feasible point that is equivalent to the optimal value function, V star. Since we have only one feasible point, it doesn't matter what we put in the objective. Here we put zero, but it could be any function of V. Uh, the solution would not change, would be always be V star. However, the constraints here are non-linear because of the max operator. And if we want a linear program, we can uh, replace them with uh, an inequality, as shown in uh, the bottom part of the slide, where uh, now we want the equality to be achieved only for the maximizing action. So we have to minimize the left-hand side, and this is what uh, we do to get uh, the so-called uh, dual LP, where uh, we, mi we minimize in the objective the expected value of the value function, and uh, we have the inequality constraints that is linear. And we can show that uh, the um, uh, initial distribution mu doesn't play a role as long as uh, it's strictly positive everywhere. So here we still have the problem of uh, having a decision variable and uh, constraints that are proportional to the number of states, that is uh, too large. And in order to extract a greedy policy according to equation one, we need the knowledge of the transition dynamics, that uh, it's not what uh, we wanted in the beginning. An alternative uh, uh, program that uh, can, leave, uh, can lead to a solution is to look at uh, the dual of uh, the program in the previous slides that we, we refer to a primal, where the decision variable is now an object uh, called occupancy measure that uh, it's as a linear objective that is just the inner product between uh, lambda and the reward function R. And the constraints, it's uh, an affine uh, constraint that is uh, imposing that the lambda is a probability distribution over the state action space that is induced by a policy acting uh, in the MDP. And here we still have the problem of uh, the large number of decision variables and uh, constraints. So to see uh, exactly that uh, we need the, the constraints uh, in the primal, we can see that uh, all the lambda satisfying the constraints can be written in uh, the form of uh, the first equation. That means uh, that uh, can be written as, as a discounted sum of the probability of visiting uh, a state action pair after a t-step according to a policy pi. And we can also easily show that strong duality holds. So now we are... Uh, replacing uh, the non-concave expression on the left-hand side, uh, v pi, with just a linear objective in lambda on uh, the right-hand side. And so that's uh, quite uh, an attractive uh, feature of the LP formulation. So just a recap that will be useful for uh, the um, uh, next uh, step of the talk. We have uh, uh, operators uh, E that uh, basically uh, represent uh, a coping of uh, the state for every action and the operator P that represent uh, the expectation with respect to the transition dynamics. In developing uh, the proximal point uh, algorithm, we will use also the Lagrangian that it's uh, the intermediate step from going uh, from uh, the primal to the dual. So this concludes the part about uh, LP in uh, reinforcement learning, and we can see how we can uh, adapt uh, the same view in the imitation learning problem. In uh, particular, we don't know uh, the um, uh, reward function, and so we cannot fix uh, uh, it in the objective. Working with cost, that it's uh, more uh, usual in uh, imitation learning, 
we will introduce a set of possible cost functions, calligraphic C, and we maximize over it the linear objective of the mean form. And now another difference is that we introduce in the objective the occupancy measure of the expert with a negative sign. So here, if you want some intuition, you can look at uh, the minimization of a lambda. This is uh, minimizing the total cost of the learner that choose lambda as an occupancy measure with respect to cost C, while the decision variable cost is trying to make uh, the cost of uh, the expert as small as possible. Be and that makes sense if we assume that the expert is optimal or nearly optimal. Uh, this object in the distance is also called uh, uh, the C distance, and we will provide guarantees that uh, the C distance is small if we uh, solve this problem with the proximal point algorithm. Since uh, the uh, occupancy measure live in the probability simplex, we will use a proximal point in uh, the Bregman setup because we can, in this way, avoid the projecting back to the simplex if we choose the Bergman divergence to be uh, the KL. Um, the interesting feature of a proximal point is that when uh, it can be implemented exactly, we can get arbitrary fast rate, making the step size eta uh, very big. But uh, we will see that when we implement it inexactly, we will have uh, some trade-off on the step size. This will be an interesting feature to look at when we present the final result in the theorem. So this concludes the overview of the main tools uh, we will use proximal point and the LP formulation. But in the first slide, we still said that uh, we would like to have uh, a bound that does not depend on the number of state and the number of action because they are potentially very large. A first step in the theoretical reinforcement learning literature is to assume some structure on uh, the MDP. In particular, we assume that uh, the reward uh, is uh, linear with respect to some known feature of the state and action, and the transition dynamics are also uh, linear with respect to this uh, known feature phi that depends on the state and action, in a product with some unknown uh, mapping from state to some dimension d uh, that is uh, instead known. So once we do this structural assumption on uh, the Markov decision process, we would like to have a bound that depends only on the feature dimension uh, d of uh, the feature mapping phi. Exploiting this structure in uh, the um, imitation learning program, we can uh, um, rewrite it as following. So I'm uh, plugging in, uh, instead of uh, the cost, I'm uh, plugging in uh, the feature times uh, the W vector. And instead of the probability dynamics, I'm plugging in uh, the, uh, the linear expression for the probability dynamics. And now I can define a new variable uh, rho that is equal to phi transpose lambda. And I replace uh, uh, rho in uh, the first constraint of the second program. And uh, I have an additional constraint that is imposing the equality I just defined. And this, it's an important step to be able to extract uh, the policy in a model-free way without the need of knowing the transition dynamics. So now uh, our algorithm, p square il, is uh, derived simply applying proximal point on the Lagrangian of the last program that I showed. And it turns out that it's equivalent to the following uh, alternation uh, procedure. We have a policy evaluation phase where we find uh, the um, cost weight wk and the value function uh, weight theta k that maximizes uh, gk, that is a concave and smooth function that you can see at the bottom of the slide. And once we have uh, the theta k that maximizing this, we can update a policy uh, in the policy improvement step. And it turns out that when you can solve exactly the maximization in the policy evaluation step, this is equivalent to proximal point in uh, the Bergman setup exactly. However, we were interested to see what happens if uh, we have some uh, error in the policy evaluation phase, that uh, this can arise for either uh, the sampling approximation or uh, because of some uh, optimization errors. 
It turns out that uh, we can still provide uh, guarantees for the citizens of the policy output of the algorithm with tricky steps. First, we show how the error propagates, and then we will show that the error at every um, iteration is small. Um, the first result is the error propagation. You see that we have a first uh, uh, term that is uh, um, equal to log of the dimension over k, and that uh, would be the rate of proximal point if no error were committed. But uh, if we have error, we have a leading term that is uh, the sum of the square root of the errors at every iteration with k. To show that the error uh, is small at every iteration, we had to do a quite complex analysis uh, because uh, the stochastic gradients of the function g are biased since uh, you have uh, an expectation inside the exponential. But uh, it turns out that you can uh, take all uh, these... Uh, bias as well. So uh, in the end, choosing uh, k uh, outer group as epsilon minus 1 and uh, the t, the number of uh, bias garden descent update as epsilon minus 4, we were able to derive a final sample complexity of epsilon minus 5. On the downside, we had to assume uh, exploration, in particular that uh, the minimum eigenvalue of uh, the expected covariance matrix of the fiction mapping is bounded away from zero. And that's it's an interesting future direction to avoid uh, such an assumption or uh, ensure that it holds with some algorithmic design. We wanted to have an algorithm that achieve uh, convincing uh, performance uh, also in practice. And uh, that's what uh, we um, observed uh, in uh, this uh, tabular environment first where uh, our algorithm p squared IL achieved uh, in uh, a very small number of samples from uh, the environment uh, the expert performance in uh, the plot CRM uh, normalizing between 0 and 1 the total return achieved by the expert and 0 is uh, the performance of a random policy. And we see that we can uh, outperform in uh, most of the cases uh, IQ earn, that it's another uh, a recent uh, algorithm that was uh, proposed for the imitation learning problem, and more classical baseline as uh, adversarial imitation learning uh, in black and uh, the famous Gale in gray. In that case, we had the uh, linear function uh, approximation, but uh, we wanted to see what happens if we replace the approximation of the state action value function with the uh, neural network. In this case, we cannot uh, claim that we have uh, guarantees from uh, the theoretical part, but we still observe uh, a very convincing performance in this uh, continuous control domain where uh, we have uh, robots with a different uh, topology of their body that tries to walk uh, as fast as they can. And again, one is the expert performance, and uh, sometimes we even achieve the super expert uh, performance that was uh, uh, a very good feature of uh, the algorithm, despite was uh, not expected from the theoretical point of view. In uh, some cases, we are interested in the offline setting, where uh, once uh, the learner is given the expert demonstration, can no longer assess a sample from the dynamics. He has to use only the expert demonstration to learn uh, a nearly optimal policy. We notice that with a simple modification, namely just changing the center point uh, of uh, the Bergman divergence uh, in uh, the proximal point algorithm, we are uh, able to derive an algorithm for the offline case. From the implementation point of view, we have just to change uh, uh, the occupancy measure in the first term of the function g. Namely, if you recall there, we had uh, the occupancy measure lambda at the previous iterate uh, by k. But now we replace it uh, with uh, the lambda uh, pi e, that is uh, the observed uh, expert occupancy measure. We see that uh, this uh, variation also works well. And now in the x-axis, we don't have samples from uh, the simulator of the learner, but we have uh, the number of uh, expert trajectory that we need uh, to have in the data set to achieve uh, a good performing policy. And we see that also in this case, we perform uh, either comparably or uh, better than 
IQ earn. And again, one, it's uh, the expert performance. And the Pong, it's uh, an environment from the Atari benchmark, so with the visual input that uh, we think it's quite challenging. And uh, it's interesting that uh, we performed well in that setting. So to conclude, uh, we noticed that uh, P squared uh, IL, it's uh, important because uh, it achieves uh, many desirable properties uh, at the same time. In particular, we have uh, simple complexity bounds in uh, the more realistic setting where we don't have knowledge of the transition dynamics. We don't have uh, access to a simulator, but we have uh, to access samples uh, only acting with the policy in the environment. And that's a feature in common only with the uh, optimistic apprenticeship uh, learning uh, and optimistic gay. That, uh, however, focuses on uh, finite horizon setting and uh, they have a different analysis. But at the same time, it has a strong uh, empirical performance, as uh, other algorithms do, but uh, without having uh, guarantees uh, for the sample uh, setting, only for uh, the known uh, transition dynamic setting. And uh, it's also um, training um, stable during training in the sense that uh, it does not have to alternate over optimization of the cost weights and optimization of the state action by weights, but uh, we just maximize jointly the function g over the space of w and theta. We have uh, more uh, in uh, the paper that will come uh, soon. In particular, we have a discussion of uh, the duality result, as I showed for the reinforcement learning case for the imitation learning program. We have the theoretical guarantees for uh, the offline setting that I didn't cover for uh, the sake of time. And uh, akin to inverse reinforcement learning, we can uh, also recover uh, a cost that uh, we notice that this empirically that allows to recover the optimal policy even under different uh, dynamics from the one uh, observed during the expert interaction. We have uh, the open question of uh, improving uh, the sample complexity rate. We think that uh, it should be able to match the epsilon minus two lower bound in the simulator setting. It would be interesting to provide uh, guarantees for uh, the recovered uh, reward function, while now we have guarantees only for the imitating policy. It would be interesting to avoid uh, the exploration assumption uh, with respect to the minimum eigenvalue. And it would be interesting to analyze uh, how the policy improvement errors propagate. Uh, we were studying uh, the evaluation error, where uh, we don't maximize exactly the function g. But we assume that you can compute exactly the policy pi k plus 1 given pi k and uh, the perfect knowledge of uh, the q value function. But if you have a continuous action space, uh, this is not the case. So um, it would be interesting uh, to do that. So that's uh, it for me. These are uh, the references. And uh, I'm happy if uh, there is any question. Questions? Uh, maybe I'll ask um, a couple of quick ones. So this uh, eigenvalue assumption for exploration. Mm -hmm. uh, suppose our task is um, not imitation learning, but maybe just behavioral cloning, so that we try to somehow mimic the expert. Yeah. Do you think we still would need such an assumption? So behavioral cloning, if you do it uh, just um, without assessing uh, the environment, I think you don't have this assumption because uh, you are not uh, deploying a policy in the environment and you don't need uh, to basically ensure this condition for the policy of the learner. Mm -hmm. But I think that you would have a more restrictive assumption on the expert data set because they would need to cover uh, uh, all the state so action. One way or another, you need some sort of an exploration, I yeah, guess, uh, yeah, if you yeah. want to perform well on the overall environment. Yeah, that's exact. And um, do, you, do you have any ideas how to get to this uh, epsilon squared lower bound? To the epsilon squared lower bound? Yeah, we have uh, some uh, ideas. Probably, proximal point, it's uh, 
uh, nice because uh, it's non theoretical to achieve an uh, arbitrary fast rate in the exact gradient case, but we had this maximization to perform at every uh, case step that uh, it's uh, quite costly in uh, terms of a uh, simple trajectory. So if we can avoid uh, this uh, complete maximization but just do an update for G and an update for Pi, I think uh, it could give a better result in terms of Epsilon. Okay. Thank you, Luca. Masashi, you have a question? Yeah, yeah. So thank you very much for the great presentation. So the proposed method looks quite promising. So uh, I have a question about empirical results. So the results are actually quite, quite good and fascinating. I, I wanted to have more intuition why the proposed method outperformed previous methods in, in this way. Can you give us a bit more intuition about that? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I think that when you go to continuous control experiment, uh, why an argument performs better than the other, it's always uh, a bit uh, of a mystery. But uh, I think that uh, this... Um, new feature of the algorithm of maximizing jointly uh, with respect to the cost uh, and uh, the value function weight, it's uh, quite promising for uh, stability during training. Because other algorithms like uh, uh, Gale that alternates between uh, updating uh, the cost and then given the cost, uh, update uh, the parameters for the state action value function, uh, requires coordination during learning. You have uh, more uh, hyperparameters to play with and uh, makes uh, the training more difficult uh, to converge. I don't know if uh, it seems a reasonable explanation to you, but um, I think uh, it's at least one of the most novel features of the algorithm that uh, mm -hmm. it's a potential explanation for this. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, actually, our team is also working on imitation learning, and particular we call weekly supervised imitation learning. So, where so given demonstrations are not really you know given by experts, but some are by non-experts, or some are noisy, but still we want to somehow you know learn, learn from those noisy demonstrations. Perhaps we can somehow combine our idea into your framework so that we can have even better solution. So maybe you can have some, some discussion later. Thank you. Yeah, of course. It sounds exciting.